turn to Psalms 40. We're going to read uh, 1 through 8. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them. Yet there are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted. But you have given me an open ear. Burnt offerings and sin offering, you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. You know you're in trouble when I need more than one <laughs> thing. And um, I was warned years ago never to adjust this because it's at Ivan height. <laughs> so I need Chris height for this. So before we start, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, you are God and we are not. And as um, I hear that the women talk about in their Sunday school and we talk about in ours as men, um, you are a wonderful God. And we need a Savior. Father, thank you that you loved us so much to send your Son. Lord, I ask today that the words I speak are your words. I pray even more that the words that are heard are your words. We are not here to glorify man. We are only here to glorify you in your holy name. Amen. So I love humor, and accidental humor might be my favorite humor. And if you look in your bulletins today, under the offering it says the title of this teaching is Waiting. And under that it says please see insert for sermon outline. You're going to get a lot of practice on waiting. Because there is no sermon outline. So teaching is now done. I love accidental humor. All right, so it's kind of funny today. Uh, Scott's Sunday school teaching taught very much about what I'm going to teach today, yet from a completely, well, first of all, from the New Testament, where I'm in the Old Testament, and from a different book of the Bible. Uh, where I'm in Psalm and he's in Hebrews. And it just shows the amazing thread throughout the Bible. And uh, I really do love the Old Testament uh, because I grew up because that's the mean, the mean God. You know, that's the fire and brimstone God. Um, man, there's so much love in the Old Testament, so much grace in the Old Testament, and so much call to us that we need a Savior throughout the Old Testament. So as I was, um, as I landed on the psalm a few weeks ago, I was just struck with the first line, I waited patiently for the Lord. And that brought up two of my biggest issues throughout the entire Bible that I struggle with. Two of the hardest commandments throughout the Bible. They often said, do not fear and do not be anxious. If there's two things I'm really good at, fear and anxiety, I think we all are. But before we get into this, let's take a little context, biblical context view of fear and anxiety. Now, the Bible's never told us to walk through life, you know, do not fear. It doesn't mean you walk through life like you're some invincible superhero. That would be a lie. 
were not indestructible. Now, when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, the Christians were not destroyed because they had fled as Jesus had commanded them to do way back in Matthew 24. As the Roman army advanced on Judea, the Christians didn't huddle up and say, do not fear, as a way to build themselves up as being invincible against the greatest army in the world at the time. They left to the hills as Jesus had instructed them 37 years prior. Now, Roman armies don't sneak up on you. They're loud and they're walking. Um, but they obeyed what Jesus had said 37 years prior. So when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, I think it was last numbers I saw, or most recent numbers in my research, was 1.2 million Jews were killed. Nearly zero Christians were killed. They had fled to the hills as they had been told. So overcoming fear in a biblical way does not involve foolish risk. It involves eternal perspective. Now in Matthew 10, 28, I believe we learn what eternal perspective looks like. In Christ's words, when he says, and do not fear those who, kill, who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So we're not to fear the people who can kill our bodies. Who are we to fear? The one who can kill both body and soul in hell. Now, I was just talking about the mean king of the Old Testament. These are Jesus' words. Now, a quick uh, word search for the word fear in the ESV version of the Bible, which um, oh, is personally, personally what I use, and I think a lot of us use here, reveals 437 instances of the word fear. Um, when I first started my Christian walk, I had a concordance, big, thick book of words from the Bible. Man, there are, the internet's really cool, because that took me about three seconds to search. So fear appears in the ESV version 437 times. The words anxious and anxiety, the combination there, appear another uh, 30 times. So you're talking 467 times of instances of fear, anxiety, and anxious, or anxiousness. The word worry actually appears in the ESV zero times. It just was the word choice that they chose. They chose anxiety and fear versus the word worry. Now the word love, everybody loves love. Jesus is love, 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 appears 684 times in the English Standard Version. I would have said, you know, like, we have this little rule when we play trivia. There's this part of trivia a few of us guys here play on Thursday nights. Whatever the question is about numbers, lately we said, okay, whatever we think, times it by 10. Because that's how far off we were. Now this week we were off by like times 40. But I would have thought love would appear two, three, four, five hundred thousand times. I mean, it's hyperbole, but I would have thought a lot more than 684. So when you think of it, Every time you see the word love in the Bible, and everybody loves seeing the word love, you will have seen fear, anxious, or anxiety two-thirds of the time. So every three times you see love, you see fear twice. It's not a small subject. It's a rather huge subject. But unlike love, which lifts up, misplaced, key in on that word, misplaced fear and anxiety are stumbling blocks that trip us up. Love lifts us up, misplaced fear and anxiety trips us up. Best way that I can describe misplaced fear versus proper fear is thinking back to Matthew uh, 10.28. Misplaced fear is temporal. The ones that could destroy your body, like us, their life is a vapor. They're gone gone. Proper fear is eternal. God can destroy both body 
and soul in hell. Eternal. Misplaced fear happens today, tomorrow, 20 years from now. It's temporal. But even knowing this, even knowing this with head knowledge, okay, I know this, but I succumb to fear and anxiety. I succumb to worry. I break down because of the things that are up here, even though I know they're temporal. So there must be an answer, and this is why I hate, I'll just say, I hate these commands of do not fear, because I don't know how to do it. But I think there is an answer. But thinking about these things made me kind of curious, and, and I love lists. Um, forgot what Tonight Show guy had list, or maybe it was Letterman, I don't know. But I found a list of fears, 100 fears, which I am not going to break them all out now. But I do uh, want to touch on some, because I thought they were kind of interesting. The number one fear, arachnophobia. Fear of spiders, right? I heard an amen. Um, number three, acrophobia. Fair, yeah, Jeff knew that one, fear of heights. And I, I would argue with that, it's more of a fear of a landing, but <laughs> I'm not going to split hairs. Agoraphobia, the fear of open or crowded spaces. Well, that's just spaces. <laughs> so open or it's crowded, but agoraphobia. Um, I guess that's what I would have because I don't like crowds. Crowds are random. Crowds I can't control. I can't escape. I'm not, not a crowd guy. Claustrophobia. Fear of small spaces. Misophobia. This one I thought was interesting. Thinking of Howard Hughes. He had misophobia. Fear of germs. Carcinophobia. Pretty straightforward. The fear of cancer. And as Holly and I were talking about that, who doesn't have the fear of cancer? These next two I found completely humorous, because the first one my grandmother has. I thought, she's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but she does have this. Ornithophobia, the fear of birds. The bird, birds, come on. And I'm talking parakeet all the way up to vulture. But what I found in this list that was so awesome was the next one. Electorophobia, the fear of chickens. <laughs> so somewhere in this list, they went, bird? No, no, let's refine. It's not just birds I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of chickens. And I hate to tell you, I ain't afraid of my food, so. Um. <laughs> chickens, cows, no fear at all. This one I swore had to be made up, but it's not. Hippopotomonstrosesquipedaliophobia, the fear of long words. <laughs> if you have it, you don't have time to tell anybody about it, I guess. <laughs> number 31 on the top 100 list of things to be afraid of. That was number 26, fear of long words. Number 31, theophobia, the fear of God. If this list is accurate, people are wasting a whole lot of time before they get to the fear of God. And that kind of broke my heart, as did number 88. Cholrophobia. It kind of hurts me a little bit that this one's all the way at 88, personally, where it should be number one. Uh, I'll say number two. Fear of God, number one. Fear of two, the, the fear of clowns. Um, clowns have never been funny, never will be funny. They are the stuff of nightmares. But there were a hundred things on this list. People have a lot of time to be afraid. And there was only one thing on this list that was valid. The fear of God. So we talk about, or I'm talking about all this fear and anxiety, and the word fear and anxiety and anxious was nowhere in our scripture reading. The reason is because I believe the answer, the solution, the application is to be found in waiting upon the Lord. So that's really the theme of today's teaching. 
is waiting upon the Lord is act of obedience performed out of delight and pleasure. And in, in that act of obedience to the Lord, we learn not to fear the challenging circumstances that we find ourselves in. <clears throat> Rich, if you can make a note in 2021 budget, if we can budget for a cup holder. <laughs> it's the only thing we don't have up here. What, what you believe about waiting upon the Lord is a direct reflection about what you believe about his sovereignty over everything, especially your life. Stephen Lawson says this about sovereignty. The sovereignty of God is not a secondary doctrine that is relegated to an obscure corner of the Bible. Rather, this truth is the very bedrock doctrine of all scripture. This is the Mount Everest of biblical teaching, the towering truth that transcends all theology. From its opening verse, the Bible asserts in no uncertain terms that God is and that God reigns. In other words, he is God, not merely in name, but in full reality. God does as he pleases, when he pleases, where he pleases, how he pleases, and with whom he pleases in saving undeserving sinners. How do you wait upon a God that is not sovereign? You can't. So, any understanding concerning sovereignty that precludes the completely unusurpable standing of God as king over everything for all time past, present, and future will lead to a heart that will eventually be disobedient to the God you serve. So, starting with this understanding of God's sovereignty, we begin our discussion about waiting upon the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Eric Watkins from Ligonier Ministries writes this, Is anything harder than waiting upon God? How many times have we prayed for the same things repeatedly, only to learn that God's answer appears to be no or not yet? In the midst of waiting, we are often tempted to become impatient and frustrated with God, and perhaps even worse, we are tempted to play God. One of the big ongoing discussions, whether it's in small group or prayer group, is our brokenness over our children that have walked away from the Lord. There is only one that can fix that. And he listens. He listens to his children being us. But what happens when you go try to fix it? No one has ever been nagged into heaven. But they've been nagged right to hell. So waiting upon the Lord. Uh, the Hebrew word in this case, kava, means to wait, to look for, with hope and expectation. So let's be clear, when the Lord says wait, he doesn't mean put your hands under your keister and just stay there. This isn't mom trying to renew her license at the DMV. You wait. Don't move, don't breathe, don't look, don't do nothing. Wait. No, this isn't that. This is active obedience. So what does Christian waiting look like? Should we just be standing around doing nothing? Hey, we need help over. Nah, I'm waiting upon the Lord. I have this problem in my life. I'll just wait. I promise you something will happen. No. In our text, we read the psalmist state, I waited patiently. When you think patiently, how patient are you when you're anxious and fearful? Not once, not at all. The Bible exhorts us to not be anxious or fearful and to be active about it. 
In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, we read, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hmm. So we're going to pray, and we're going to be thankful. Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you in my righteous right hand. Mark 5, 35 and 36. While, we, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. So it seems to me that we have a couple of choices of what we can do when we're facing despair and seeking the Lord to rescue us. One, fear and anxiety. It's an option. It's an option many of us go right to. Clean that man in the mirror. Let's go right to that. The world is falling apart. Or what we see in the Bible, wait expectantly upon the Lord with thanksgiving and prayer while we await for him to strengthen us as we continue to believe in him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That doesn't sound like lazy idleness to me. It sounds like active obedience. So why do we wait? Well, we have two choices, fears or promises of God. Spurgeon says this, it is a blessed thing to wait only on God. You have proved everything else to be a failure. You, 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 me. We've proven everything else to be a failure. And now you hang upon the bare arm of God alone. There is certainly enough for us to depend on there. So how many of us, after we've exhausted every other option that we could do, okay, fine. I'm going to trust in God. Because you know, you're trusting yourself. <laughs> you kept digging that hole. Put down the shovel, folks. No. We only come to God sometimes after we've exhausted our options. So I'm going to... Um, I just want to share some things. This is not by any means exhaustive of what the Bible says about God's promises. But I just want to lay the groundwork of God's character. In Matthew 6, 25 through 34, and I'm not going to read it all, but I should have gone wireless mic so I can move around. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... How much more will he clothe you? And jumping down to verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day, uh, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So what we have here is a promise from God. He will both clothe you and feed you. But what happens when you lose your job? What happens when you carry two houses? Holly and I both lost our job a couple of weeks before getting married. What do you do? Zach and Angel found mold in their kitchen. What do you do? Everybody here could tell a story. What do you do? It's, it's fine when I have a job to say God will clothe me and feed me, but what do I do when I don't? 
where do you put your, do you go fair and anxious or do you wait? It's very difficult. Uh, second passage that I want to share. I didn't trust myself finding the scripture in time, so I uh, cheated and put a little post-it notes all over my Bible. Uh, 1 John 4, 18 and 19. We read, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. We have a promise from God that he loves you. But what do you do when family and friends end relationship with you over your desire to follow Christ? I've lost a child who doesn't want to speak to me partially because we follow Christ. What do you do? Is everybody really excited about seeing their family on Thanksgiving or is there a little bit of truth that you know there could be friction based on what you believe? What do you do? do you, are you to be fearful? In 1 Peter 3, 14 through 16, we see, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. God will put mockers to shame. There's a promise for you. There is coming a day when you might lose your livelihood because of Christ. And I'm afraid that day is coming sooner than later. This church, maybe at the very least in the future, will be picketed for our belief that the absolute truth is in Scripture. In Isaiah 35, 4, we see, Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. The Bible says, Do not have an anxious heart. Your God will avenge you. Yet today, we have missionaries all over the world who will be killed for the name of Christ. According to Open Doors, it estimates that Christians are martyred on average of 11 per day. On average today, 11 of your brothers and sisters will be killed because of Christ. I don't think we could be any further away from that reality than in the middle of Illinois, in the middle of the United States. But 11 of your family, your eternal family, will be killed today. Three to 4,000 per year will be killed because of our Savior. But what does God promise? They will be avenged. Not by you, not by me, by him. I might want to avenge, but I bet he's way better at doing it. And I chose these verses on purpose, Old Testament, New Testament, because I just love that thread throughout the entire Bible. John 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you also, you may be also. 
You're going to spend eternity with Christ. You're worried about tomorrow? Let me tell you where you're going to spend forever. You know, we're remodeling our home right now, or about to, because things here fall apart. Thomas's car is in the shop because things here fall apart. I, I think um, that carpenter who's building my eternal home right now, I think that's going to hold up. But we're all going to die here. It's not like the movies where the best we can hope for here is a, a peaceful passing. Those of us who belong to Christ know that we have a conquered enemy in death, although it's still an enemy. Our comfort is knowing where we're going and with whom we're going to. The last uh, section I want to look at here is from Psalm 34.4. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. The Bible says the Lord delivered me from all my fears. God delivers on his promises. In the middle of the night when anxiety and terror strikes you, what better weapon do you have at your disposal than the fact that your king fulfills promises? Each time. Every time. For all time. None of us ever questions gravity. But why would we ever question God's promises? So far he's batting a thousand and I think he'll keep it up. His promises are true each time, every time, for all time. So I want to give some examples of what waiting in action looks like. Bless you. During times of danger... Psalm 57, 1 tells us, be merciful, to, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was looking at this and he said, what a mixture of feebleness and strength there is in this first verse. The feebleness is so beautified by being clothed in the strength of faith. I'm not standing here saying, I'm Captain America, I can handle it. No. I have nothing, Lord. Be merciful to me. Spurgeon says, if you cannot see the brightness, if I cannot see the brightness of your face, the shadow of your wings will be enough for me. So if you can't see... God working the beautiful things he does, then rest in the shadow of his wings. It's safe. I was sharing something with Holly this morning, um, or last night, I don't know. Uh, but I was just looking back at my life, and my father was not up for any humanitarian awards, we'll just put it that way, my biological father. And when he left my mother when I was a kid, I grew up in a challenging environment. Uh, my mother's only 18 years older than me, so it's, you know, a kid raising a kid. And life was challenging. <coughs> and, but because of that, she met my dad, my stepdad, who's a great guy, loved him a lot, when I was about four, and they got married when I was five, and I got a father, a good earthly father. And then they moved out to the suburbs and go through life. And then I had a, a marriage that fell apart. And that's not a great blessing. That's a lot of pain. I had a son that was born premature and died and still breaks my heart. But because of that, my marriage falling apart, which is not honoring to God in any way, I ended up moving to the north side of Chicago where I met Holly a couple of years ago, or a couple of years later. We got married and we moved out to here to be closer to my boys. 
But because we moved out to here to be closer to my boys, my daughter met her future husband working at Panera. And now when I see my grandson on Wednesday, that couldn't happen if my father wasn't a dirtbag. God knew this. I did not know this. So if I can't see the glory of his face, I'm going to rest in the shadow of his wings because I've seen what he does, even if I can't see the end game of how beautiful it is. It takes a lot of dirt to raise food, don't it? What about during times of persecution? I have written down here Rack Shack and Benny because I learned my Old Testament from Veggie Tales. <laughs> Loved Veggie Tales when my kids were little. But in Daniel 3 14, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Have we started to hear this in life? What happens when you don't worship what the government tells you to or what the news or media or peer pressure tells you to? How much more are we going to see it? It's not going to slow down. In Daniel 3, 15, second part of that, but if you do not worship, you shall be immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Huh. We're about to see what waiting looks like in the face of persecution. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in that matter, or in this matter. This is a verse I really got to learn to take to heart. When the world's telling you, who's going to save you? I don't need to answer you anything. Why aren't you doing this? I don't really need to answer that. But here, we'll just go ahead and say this. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Even if he doesn't save us, is he any less God? No. Any time that I think of this, I think of something Scott said maybe a year ago. There was that one guy who was kind of crazy-ish, seemed that way to me, went and visited an island full of angry people that like to kill outsiders, and that missionary was killed like that. And Scott said something that still sticks with me. If he hadn't done that, would we be praying for those people today? So even if God doesn't save you, God has a plan, and you were part of that plan. So during times of persecution, Rack, Shack, and Benny waited upon the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So I figure this is a good rule to live by. So what did Christ do? What did our ultimate role model do when it came to waiting? Well, one, he was obedient to scripture in the wilderness. Okay, not going to eat. 40 days, 40 nights. What a prime time for the devil to tempt you. The devil tempted him with an easy out. You're stressed out. Now, mind you, Christ was, was human, 100%. He felt it. So when Satan tempts you with food, power, rest, peace, whatever he wants to give you, or the illusion of, Christ came back and said, the Lord says. That is the best way to be obedient to Scripture. The Lord says. Or Lazarus, Jesus' friend Lazarus, is going to die. Jesus literally waited two days before going back. And in that time, Lazarus died. So in order for God to be glorified through the raising of Lazarus from the dead, Jesus had to wait 
for his friend to suffer and die because God's glory was most important. And when he went back, he cried with Mary and Martha. Cried. He didn't come back and say, don't worry, I got this. No, he knows what death was. His friend died for a bigger reason. Jesus waited in order that God's glory should be made manifold. What about death upon the cross? Couldn't he have called a legion of angels to save him? He waited to physically die. His legs were not broken. He did not asphyxiate. He died. And then that man in the mirror, me, you, Jesus waits on us every single minute of every single day because we are being sanctified, being made more like him, and it just doesn't happen overnight. I need to screw up. You need to screw up. I need forgiveness. I need to repent. You need to repent. It takes time, and he waits upon us. Does he not want his bride spotless, clean now? Probably but yet he waits. Or the ultimate waiting, Matthew 26. When Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch over me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass until I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the words again, the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus knew what death was going to be, and it was not going to be pretty. And he went to his father, and if it be your will, father, let this pass from me. No. Went back to his father again. If it be your will, let this pass from me. It's not a hint, this is a request. No. No. One more time, Father, let this pass from me, if it be your will. No. But he actively waited in seeking his Father, and yet the cup would not pass. So the path to Jesus' crucifixion was a rock, and his steps were made secure. It's not all about happy endings but it's about God's path. Jesus suffered all the temptations and sorrows that we face, and then some. Jesus was no Teflon savior. All the world's troubles stuck to him the same way they stick to us. Hunger, pain, anxiety. He was in despair. I'm in despair when my Wi-Fi goes out. He's in despair over death. But the thing is, it's not just a regular death. It's a death for this guy. And those guys. And for all the sins I committed, I am committing and will commit. And all of God's wrath will be on him. That's despair. So let's take a look at some application here. Starting with the sovereignty of God. So belief in God's undisputed, unchallenged, and irrevocable sovereignty 
is the bedrock of our ability to be obedient to his commands and have faith in his promises. If your God is not in charge of everything all the time, what promises can you believe then? Whether you believe God is sovereign or not doesn't change the fact that he is sovereign and he takes counsel from nobody, not even you. And God does it all. We read in verses 1 and 2, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon the rock. Who set your feet upon the rock? He set your feet upon the rock, making my paths or steps secure. Who secured your steps? He secured your steps. You did not lift you out of the miry bog. You did not put your feet upon the rock, and you did not make your steps secure. He did it all. Realizing that God does it all allows us the freedom from the sin of pride and also allows us to praise God over praising ourselves. We're not a pull-yourselves-up-by-the-bootstraps kind of church. We're not a be-all-you-can-be church. Just believe in yourself, church. No, it's all about God. And then we're to praise God with him, with the praises he himself put in our heart. We read in verse 3, He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. We like singing songs about ourselves. But no, God's going to remove that from you. He's going to put his song in your heart, in your mouth allow you to praise him with his words. And that allows us to trust in God. You know, reading your Bible and noting God's fulfilled promises, God does not back out of his commitments regardless of the people he's committed to. God doesn't break covenants. Man does. The answer is do not lie in the world of flesh. We believe that he will fulfill the promises. In verses 4 and 5, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell them, yet they are more than can be told. Don't go following after the new fangled solutions. All it takes is a little while and you'll see all those Fancy people who command your attention, and it seems like lately you just find them in the media more and more being in trouble for more and more things. God's saying, no, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. And then we can delight in the Lord. We hand out medals of valor to heroes. Some people have saved others, and some have even brought others back from the brink of death. God is better than heroes. God doesn't bring you back to life. He makes you alive. You weren't drowning in the ocean. You were fish food. You were not just dead. You were a dead enemy of God. God made you alive and made you family to himself, heirs, brothers and sisters, and friends. Delight in your Lord. The world has done nothing for you. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. I think that's the music where the little hook's going to come pull me off the stage. It's like the end of the award show. But I'm also at the end of my teaching, so... Good timing. Um, That was a subtle hint. Holly, I'm going to check your phone later. (laughs) But when you realize what God has done for you, that allows you to trust him, delight in him, and, oh, what a much better place to be. I just think of all the people who were really important in my life. All of them, like me, have made mistakes. All of them, like me, have let me down. God hasn't let me down. Not once. Not once. 
So as we close today, I want to read a passage from Isaiah 40. Because I, I think this leaves two questions unanswered. One, is God willing to save us? I could talk about it all day long, but is he willing to save us? So from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11, Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs in his arms, he will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. Sounds like a God who's willing to save you, wanting to save you. But that begs the second question, can he? Is he able to save you? So carrying on at verse 12 through 17. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from the bucket, a uh, drop in a bucket, and are accounted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are nothing before him. They are counted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. That is one mighty God. So you have both a God that can save you and is willing to save you. So in our final prayer, I just want to offer up to God his own words from Psalm 32, verses 5 through 8. For God alone... O oh, my soul, wait in silence, and for my, hope is, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Amen.